the for me. Now, uh, for me, you have the floor to give us the introduction and the update. Hello again. Uh, part of what um, I'd like to do in a very brief session here, because I think most people, I think th at least three quarters of the people in this room um, reviewed or at least have seen the background uh, to this uh, research project in other meetings. Uh, even those at King's, uh, we presented this, or at least I presented on behalf of this group in a seminar at King's as well. Uh, in a meeting in February, we covered a lot of the background work. But having said that, because we recognize that there are few people who uh, are attending this for the first time, I think it's, work, you know, it's, it's important to work ourselves uh, from the point of introducing what this project is about uh, and what we're seeking to focus on. So in that respect, um, I'll just give a very short abstract of sort uh, on, this, on this project. Well, what we have sought to do, as Njeri said earlier, this project is about the role of political settlements in peace building and state building. But the way we've couched our particular project is around the reframing of narratives of peace building and state building in Africa and what we can learn, therefore, from political <coughs> settlements at the end of armed conflict. So broadly, <coughs> our research argues for <coughs> excuse me, our research argues for a rethinking of approaches to peace building and state building in Africa. Uh, and this comes from the premise that current approaches to peace and state building rely on a dominant narrative that constructs state building as a prerequisite to peace. And those dominant narratives were uh, I alluded to when we talked about liberal, the liberal peace agenda earlier. Uh, and even though this is not just an African focus thing, but you could see a trend in which the narrative that surrounds uh, peacemaking and peace building around once a state has, you know, uh, resorted to armed conflict, it's about the weakness of that state uh, because it's unable to, uh, if you like, withdraw the monopoly of the means of violence to the center, to the state. Uh, or because it has weak institutions. So the one way in which we can ensure that conflict, you know, does not return, again, is still a peace-building dilemma of sorts, is that we help this state become stronger by helping it gain the capacity uh, to, uh, if, if you like, monopolize uh, the, the means of violence, uh, if you like, create institutions for it, and even when the state is not really in that much trouble, we still have things about uh, the capacity of the state uh, to, to generate taxes, to do a whole range of things. So it's a large conversation around state capacity and what state building ought, ought to be. So the moment a country returns or recedes to a situation or degenerates to, into, into violence, we start looking at doing state building in particular ways. So you can clearly see in international responses the intersection between peace building that I discussed earlier, uh, in which you fundamentally try to make peace, keep peace. Uh, in fact, in in uh, in not uh, Galton, in in Galian terms, in Butchus Gali uh, parlance, they almost seemed like sequential activities initially. The way he the, the way he explained, or at least expressed, the notion of peace building in Agenda for Peace. So you do peace uh, making, you do peace keeping, you do peace building, then you do post-conflict reconstruction. As though these were things that are neatly framed in a conflict process, you could move from one window to another. Uh, and so, without bogging us down, uh, in, you know, in the conversation about these dominant narratives, it's important to at least understand that there's, there are dominant narratives and we're trying to challenge those dominant narratives. And they, this will emerge in, in, our conversation, in our conversation later on. So that 
you know, underpinning therefore this dominant narrative, as I was explaining earlier, is the assumption that a certain type of state will produce peace, a certain type of state, uh, liberal democratic state, if you like, will produce peace. As such, interventions in societies affected by armed conflict focus on the transfer of a model of state building that is expected to lead to, last, lead to lasting peace and stability. So we challenge in this project, we challenge this, if only we build good states, peace will come approach, all right, on several grounds, which, you know, uh, we will, for, for those who are not on the base camp system, the background paper has been there for some time, we will find a way to send it to you or connect you to it, uh, and so on. This is what we're seeking to challenge. And therefore, uh, if we're challenging this, we're saying the approach is inherently flawed. Uh, we're saying that rarely does the dominant discourse of peace building construe the outbreak, potential or actual outbreak, all right, uh, or violent conflict or intra intractable conflict, uh, which sometimes threatens the very survival of the state, okay? Rarely does it construe this sort of conflict and the efforts to reconcile affected societies as part of a continuum of state building. And I, I think I need to explain that continuum of state building a little bit because this is where we differ from the dominant narrative. Instead of seeing state building as something you do for the sake of peace, if only we build this kind of state, peace will come. What we're saying is, it's all state building anyway. These are new states that were created and they're on a journey. There's a continuum of the state making, state building process for the African state in particular, post-colonial state. And so there are many difficult conversations that go on in societies that have just been forged into a Westphalian state. So whilst we're talking amongst ourselves, if we were allowed, assuming we're allowed to talk amongst ourselves, and on our way to building the kind of state that we needed to build, some of our conversations became necessarily violent. That is what happened. We encountered conflict naturally, which is expected to be, uh, you know, for the sake of those who were not in our earlier meetings, we talked about uh, the cumulative nature of security. When people in a society desire to live well and live long, uh, but each person's journey to that ultimate goal of living well and living long necessarily differs and is fraught with a lot of complex stuff and challenges that might be gender-based, creed-based, uh, age-based, and so on. And when you have things like that, you have to mediate and manage the process. But of course, part of the management of that process is that the conversations might get heavy and become conflictual. And conflict is not necessarily a good or bad thing. It is a natural part of human interaction. So nobody is saying that conflict is bad or good. We're not putting any value on it. It is just important to have it because we must have it when we're not always on the same page. So where that degenerates into violence, if we want to come and build peace in it, it should not be about, and that's the argument we're putting on the table, it should not be about building some perfect peace at all costs through a model of a state that will bring perfect peace. Okay? We're saying that Peace building, therefore, uh, should be considered as part of a state building continuum. So if you were the United Nations and you were going to intervene in a conflict in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in Central African Republic, what you should be asking is, where were you in your conversation of state building? What happened? Where were you? What caused it? You should not be putting it on us at all costs. You must only wear this kind of hats. And the process of trying to tailor make, you know, force feed us with a liberal peace or whatever kind of peace agenda that is not consistent with the conversation. Hi, Irina. Yeah. That wasn't con consistent with the conversation we're having before. We will, of course, have the peace building dilemma. That's the argument we're making. That the peace building dilemma, that is, the recurrence of violence ever so often will be a natural part, you know, is inevitable 
if what we're doing is we're being put in a straight jacket of some kind of peace or some kind of state that is bound to lead to peace. So we're arguing that really peace building is about, you know, in fact, state building is essentially about a whole series of conversations. And if we'd run into the problem of a violent conversation during that period, our peace building process should be about returning to that conversation amongst a whole range of other things. That, 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 that's essentially what we're putting uh, on the table. So we therefore argue that peace, peace in the form that is construed by current interventions is not an end in itself. It's not that we're building because the current narrative at the moment is that let's build good states in order to build peace. Okay? And in order to build states, we need to build demo, liberal democratic states. In order to build liberal democratic states, we need to build a kind of civil society, a kind of market economy, and it's, it just keeps going on and on. Okay? So we're saying that rather, that you know, if peace in that form uh, by, uh, that is construed by current interventions is not in a, an end in itself, and that rather peace building should be conceived as part of the continuum of state building in the affected societies. And therefore, taking us to the specific things we're looking at, if we're putting this big argument on the table, uh, we're saying that we're making the claim, is all we're trying to do at the moment is to generate evidence to support that, that claim. There are many situations of armed conflict in post-independence and post-Cold War Africa are the result of state-building conversations taking place in this specific national context. And those conversations might require a distinctly different solution process or time frame. Let me, try to, let me try to make myself clear on that as well, that those conversations, I see our teammates are admiring the, the printed text. Nayanka and Abiodu, you're looking at your text and you're, you're smiling, admiring it. People have not read it to say whether it's a... <laughs> no, they have some special smiles on their faces. When they... <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, all right. Then we don't want to hear that more mischievous thing if it's going to come from your mouth, Dr. Love. All right. <laughs> so, okay, where was I in that conversation? Uh, so, you know, that many situations of armed conflict in post independence and post Cold War Africa are the result of state building con conversations taking place in this specific national con context. And that those conversations might require a distinctly different solution process or time frame from the models offered in response, uh, in the response by interveners. And those interveners, by the way, might be single nation interveners, they might be United Nations, they might be coalition of states and so on. We have also not put a particular value on those interveners at the moment. But if we suggest that interveners come anyway invariably from wherever it is that they might come, and most of the time they have good intentions. And our, our, our role here is not to challenge those good intentions, but it's about the model that is being produced, the process, uh, and the time frame, and so on. It's about the models. So in pursuit of this argument, we examine a number of conflict situations in Africa, which ended through different forms of political settlements. We draw a distinction between two types of violent or armed conflict settings. Um, and actually, maybe we shouldn't be so confident about two clear types, and we can talk about it later when, after you've heard uh, those presentations. But in any case, we look, we look at a first kind of scenario that consists of those situations of armed conflict where violence ended on the battlefield and the post-conflict agenda was pursued locally without external participation. When I say without external participation, please, I mean that without very overt, you know, institutionalized and imposed sort of external participation. I don't mean to say that externals never participate, but without, we mean that without a structured external participation that that was the governing agenda in that environment. So in this regard, we are looking at examples of Ethiopia and Rwanda. The second kind of scenario or set of cases that we're looking at include situations where the end of violence, as well as the post-conflict agenda, 
was negotiated and facilitated by external interveners. Cote d'Ivoire is an example. Uh, Kenya is an example. Sierra Leone is an example. I have not qualified or we have not qualified these conflicts in particular ways. Okay? A measure of violence went on. But the degrees of violence, you can see, uh, vary depending on the cases that you're looking at. The important thing is that the agenda was shaped. The agenda that responded to these conflicts was shaped by external actors. Okay? So we suggest that an examination of these settings might enable us to make a better, make better sense of the impact of internally and externally generated, or ex internally and externally generated, uh, sorry, driven processes, and the extent to which each helps to set conflict affected states on the course of, if you like, nation building or state building, but certainly on the course of state building in ways that produce stable peace. One of the questions that's been asking, you know, because to really distinguish what we're doing here uh, from what, um, what classically happens, I think I mentioned earlier when we were talking about what are the goals of peace building. We know that the international community, for a host of reasons, and some of which I described earlier, tends to want to simply end the violence. And it's not as if there's no merit in that, because there are humanitarian imperatives that drive this. 200,000 people and more uh, died in the, in the Liberian Civil War. And for many of these conflicts, we know that 800,000 in that range died in Rwanda as a result of genocide. So we're not saying this is a flawed imperative for intervention, but what we're saying uh, is that if we don't apply that model rigidly and we return to having the conversations that led to violence in the first instance, it's not guaranteed that there will never be violence again. That's what happens in societies that are having difficult conversations. I guess it's how you manage that space, whether an external has come in or not, how you manage it in a way that helps us dig deep to the roots of our process, of our conversation, is what we think peace building ought to be about. So having put all these caveats and all these uh, values on the table, uh, I want to emphasize that one of the things that you will see running through the different case studies, the five of them that we'll present over the next day or two, one thing you see running through it is the notion of conversation. Uh, and the notion of conversation uh, is very interesting for us because even though it's been influenced by the idea of conversing at all, we have, we're, we're, we're rerouting it, we're, you know, we're re-engineering it in a way that helps us richly look at the African context. If we say that these states were, at, you know, were going through their own process, which we call a series of conversations, and that is those conversations that led to war, those conversations are necessarily different from the notion of conversation that I have picked up certainly uh, in the literature, <clears throat> mostly Europe and North America, but Europe in particular, uh, in what was called the long 18th century, which actually dates back from around 1650 all the way uh, to uh, the late 17th something. Um, and that conversation was embraced in Europe in particular ways in which the intellectual class or a particular kind of class were present in certain places and what they call also sometimes conversable spaces. But of course it was tea houses, coffee houses and so on where they were debating concepts, issues. And ultimately you could see how those, some of the texts that they were discussing or writing made their way into practice or politics and so on. What they called conversable spaces over time, conceptually, intellectually, and I think practically expanded. So it was not just about the, the art of talking, verbal conversation, where you're engaging yourself in political debates, in political philosophy, and what is you know, moral or not to govern society. Uh, it had both formal and informal effects, even in the way that you educated uh, people informally, and therefore people understood the notion of uh, talking and presentation and so on. But it's, it found its way into art, 
you know, went out to speak to people and, you know, and, and speak back. So, so, so there's something about uh, that notion of conversation, which for us, uh, we have expanded for the purpose of this study. We ac accept the five elements, and I will then keep quiet, um, uh, Cyril. One is about interaction. In the long 18th century, that interaction was really in terms of verbal expressions, mostly. There was also writing, or the notion of essay writing. Uh, that's why Francis Bacon uh, and others, you know, began to develop ideas around the conversible space in this way. Um, Jürgen Habermas and the notion of, uh, the con of conversation became alive because it was about sociability, what became known as a public sphere, all right? Uh, as theorized by Yoga and Habermas in particular. Others have picking, uh, they picked it up <coughs> since then. So it could be in written form, uh, not least poetry or conversation pieces in the form of art. It's an interaction nonetheless. Interaction is taking place all the time. It could, you know, and so we've enlarged this to say it could be in the form of art, it could be in the form of music, it could be in violent expressions. We're not, <clears throat> excuse me, we're, we're not as a continent trying to be elegant uh, about this by restricting it to certain social spaces and social classes, but we're acknowledging that conversations have throughout history taken place in African societies. And we need not restrict ourselves when we talk about conversations around uh, state making in particular. And the conversable spaces in which conversations on state making will take place need not to be restricted to certain fora uh, or certain constitutional documents. Because historically, our society made, you know, they had conversations in fantastically elegant ways. If, if I trigger anyone to talk about their, you know, societies or groups or extended families, you would have songs that meant something. You'd have poems that meant something. You'd have actually silence, which is what I see the Kenyan team have covered the notion of silence. The fact that you were greeted by silence in a space stands for something. A conversation is taking place all the time. And if you are an excluded community and you were being governed in ways that you didn't like, your non-participation in process is part of a conversation. Your expression of violence through violence sometimes is conversation. So we can't say that Boko Haram in northeastern Nigeria is not in conversation with the Nigerian government, or that Al-Shabaab is not in conversation with the US and all these other people. We can call it immoral or whatever we call it. These are very robust conversations taking place within the states where we are based. And we're saying that that interaction for us is expansive, is not necessarily verbal, it contains all sorts of very, very interesting notions. But secondly, we're saying those conversations, of course, involve individuals and groups and entities. The conversation is taking place <clears throat> in a conversable space, which is expansive for us. We're saying number three, those in conversation engage in talking and talking back. All right? Number four, they're talking and talking back through a range of actions or inaction. Okay? And finally, this is significant for us. In those conversations, there's a distinct narrative that emerges. If people are not coming to the courtyard, if we're at the ALC and people are not showing up for lunch all the time, I mean, in the case of Kafu, is Kafu in this room? I don't think he showed up for lunch for five days. So you're thinking, what has happened? Where is he? He could be angry. He could be protesting. He could be, until another one was not showing up. Today, Frederick is not here. Then we said, oh, God, what happened? You investigated. The narrative is, there's flu that has broken, up, broken out among the fellows. It's flu. They're not uh, protesting. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. <laughs> And Jerry and uh, Hiromi, if I were you, I'll be careful. He's one of the fellows. <laughs> that is conversation. Okay? When you enter a train in a place that is flu infested, and someone's been coughing, coughing, coughing after a while, you see people's heads turn in the other direction. It's a conversation. 
Actually, the messages we're sending, and what we're saying is that in our research, the notion of conversation represents something, and we're using this to trigger, to interrogate peace and state building. That's all it is. So in a state, peace and state building context, the form that the conversation assumes expands far beyond the neat and clearly structured verbalized ideal characterized by politeness. Actually, that's who, you know, when you look at uh, the long 18th century was politeness, uh, all about politeness in which the elite or bourgeois subjects of the European society of the long 18th century interacted. Okay, conversation was synonymous with conversable spaces, uh, but they, for us they have evolved considerably. Not least, we see conversation assuming the form, various forms today, like I just described in our own African context, but even now in this generation, cy cybernetics is part of the conversation, isn't it? You are talking about how you communicate, all right? So to conclude, we're saying that the conversable world of the new states of the 20th century that emerged in the developing societies of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, some of which descended into vicious violent conflict demand a more expansive and radical examination of the notion of conversation. And there's rich empirical data to enable a distinct theorization of conversation in this vastly different context, where conversation forms are almost limitless, and the practical application is just as limitless as well. So the conversable space is rarely structured, and it's constantly mutating. In many cases, and those interactions in that space are multifarious, typically groups or clusters of interest. Expectedly, the forms that the, their conversations assumed are far more varied and complex and need to be seen through particular lenses and perspectives. And the media through which these groups assume agency and thus talk and talk back to each other are as diverse as they are innovative. A rich narrative, in, a narrative invariably emerges from these conversation forms and practice. So we argue that through an analysis of conversation in this context, using this conceptual framework, it is possible to draw a distinct set of narratives about state building and peace building in Africa, which deviates from the dominant Western narrative that currently underlines <coughs> peace and state building in Africa. That, in a nutshell, is what this research project is about. And so what you're going to hear between now and tomorrow morning is a series of case studies that is trying to look at how those conversations are taking place, in, or how they have taken place, uh, looking at historical trajectories and the conversation forms in Cote d'Ivoire, in Ethiopia, in Sierra Leone, in Rwanda, in Kenya. Our ultimate objective at the end of the day is to see whether we can begin to theory build about the notion of state building and peace building in Africa. We might come to a point after field research and the entire process where we say, oh, uh, with our tail between our legs, we submit that this Western dominant uh, narrative is the correct way. <laughs> it's relevant. Or we might say, my goodness, it is totally irrelevant, or perhaps there's a meeting point. Who knows? But that's why this is an exciting project to be part of uh, at this point in time, and I would humbly uh, give way to our colleagues uh, facilitated by Cyril. Thank you so much. Well, for me, thank you for the very comprehensive background and backdrop for, for the presentations that we're about to listen to. Albeit that uh, we need to interrogate the, build, the state and peace building nexus in Africa. To set the ball rolling, I have the pleasure of inviting Bubaka Njai, Sonia Teron, and Nyanka Pedigao to present the case study of La Côte d'Ivoire, who is going to lead. Yes, please, you have the floor. Thank you. You have 10 minutes, which can be extended to 15 and no more. Uh, who, who elected this guy again? <laughs> you have dictatorial tendencies, my friend. Well, uh, I think 15 minutes would be enough uh, for us to, uh, to, to do the job. 
Uh, let me again uh, uh, express our gratitude for being here and taking part in this very important uh, 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 undertaking. And I think uh, Fumi just uh, framed for us uh, very nicely uh, why uh, it is so important to, to tackle uh, uh, among the many challenges that uh, we face on this continent, uh, that of uh, the, the, uh, the, the nexus between uh, peace building in certain contexts and state building, and in generally state building on this continent. Uh, let me uh, uh, put on the record the extraordinary work that these two young ladies did uh, for this project. Uh, I can't uh, express how uh, proud I am and uh, how thankful I am to have worked with them. Uh, they really uh, worked their heart out on this. Uh, and uh, from now on, it's, it's, it's going to be only uh, better. Uh, that already took uh, two or three minutes, didn't it? Uh, so, la ladies, uh, uh, the, uh, the onus is on you to uh, 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 respect the uh, injunctions of, uh, of the president. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Nayaka to come and uh, uh, get the, the, the ball uh, rolling, and then uh, Sonia is going to come, and I'm going to be uh, the last for two minutes to just wrap it up. Okay. Um, I'll try and be quick. Um, so with this case study, um, we're looking at Cote d'Ivoire, um, and we basically came up with three main factors that are interrelated and interconnected in understanding peace building and state building um, in Cote d'Ivoire. So we looked at the political power, so deep historical roots of succession controversies and long-standing elite competition over the control of the post-colonial state. Second, the resentment resource scarcity, so the, uh, the way that uh, the economic resources were managed or mismanaged. And finally, identity and power, and how interrelated with the first two um, had an impact on issues of citizenship in Cote d'Ivoire. So we, we were arguing that these three interconnected issues are the underlying basing, base, basis of state building dialogues uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, at least since independence um, until today. So a quick historical background. Um, we focused um, on uh, some of the different episodes of violence, 1999 military coup, 2002 civil war, and the 2010 post-electoral crisis. Um, so quickly, pre-colonial Côte d'Ivoire was a territory made of different groups uh, with no major central authority. Northern and su southern parts evolved differently from one another um, with a religious divide, um, mainly due to Sudanic influences coming from the north. It officially becomes a French colony in uh, 1893. The colonial state was really an overseas um, ter territory of France, and all government affairs were administered from Paris. And France's policy in West Africa and in, this, in Côte d'Ivoire was uh, reflected mainly in its philosophy of association, meaning that all Africans in Côte d'Ivoire were officially French subjects, um, initially without rights to citizenship, but that later on changed. And the real raison d'etre of the colonial state was economic exploitation, um, and all spoils were transferred to France. So Côte d'Ivoire becomes independent in 1960, and Félix Oufel-Boigny assumes the presidency. And in economic terms, it was really the world's largest producer and exporter of cocoa beans. So the post-colonial state inherited um, most of all the administrative and bureaucratic infrastructures of the French colonial state, and its ties to France remain very strong. And we heard from Professor Ndia yesterday, you know, the sort of France-Afrique relationship. Um, apart from the uh, heavy influence of France, Côte d'Ivoire's political history is also linked to oufouet Boigny as a leader. Um, he was the leader of the main political party until the 1990s, um, and the Parti Démocratique de la Côte d'Ivoire. He becomes Côte d'Ivoire's first prime minister in 1959 and elected as the first president in 1960 and really served for 33 years. So in essence, <laughs> so in essence he was the state. Uh, L'État, c'est moi. Um, and in him, France also found a leader that could you know, 
push forward their interests at that particular time. Um, so they had a mutual, let's say, a mutual uh, relationship or a goal. So they exchange influence between them too, if we want to stay in that sort of um, uh, same, what we've been saying throughout this conference. Um, so the combination of his leadership France's in and France's interests were to shape the Ivorian nation political and social landscape, which would later uh, lead, well, we set the stage for violence that later erupted. Um, so Sonia will talk more about the actual conflict, but it, we're looking at 1999, two, a bloodless coup, 2001 attempted coup, 2002 country becomes divided into two, then you have 2002 to 2006, the reunification attempts. 2007, the Wugaru political agreements. Um, so this is, you know, you can see a sick, in a cyclical manner um, how violence erupted and emerged at different times. Um, so really, the, root, the roots of the conflict um, and the violence is, is the dynamics between what I've already mentioned, the fierce elite competition for power, the management and mismanagement of its economy, um, and how these two further amplify the citizenship and identity crisis in the country and the role of France. Um, and I had a, quite a lot on this, but I'll be brief. Um, so these three were inter are interrelated because really, um, Oufouet Boigny you know, came from the ruling elite of the Baole ethnic group, and he increasingly, throughout his leadership, put his people forward um, above, as being above the other, the other groups. And so in a muted way, political life became dominated by ethnicity um, and, identity, and an identity cr crisis. Um, so this system, um, this, you know, it became, you know, in policies like quotas in government, where members of his groups tended to get a higher share, uh, or even is, there was quite a, it was a policy of the land belongs to those who develop it, uh, which encouraged members of his ethnic group to migrate to forested areas and plant cocoa. Um, so, and even there was an Im immigration policy that was also, you know, pushing for um, from, for foreigners to come from neighboring countries um, to work in Ivory Coast. But all of all of these um, policies that were deeply entrenched in the government um, actually exacerbated um, identity issues in the country. So it's a politicization and manipulation of ethnicity um, for political end, uh, political ends. Um, and these became more and more evident throughout Boigny and throughout his successes, so throughout the country's leadership transitions. Um, the concept of Ivorite emerged and quickly moved from being you know, an attempt to define Ivorian identity into a political tool, really, um, used to remain in power and control the state. So, I think I can stop there, otherwise. Um, and Sonia will look into the responses to the conflict. Yeah, thank you, Nayanka. So um, as mentioned, I'm gonna look at the peace process that followed um, when the conflict started and the country was split in two. Um, and basically, for the sake of time, I'm gonna summarize this in three basic issues that, um, or themes that hampered the state building conversation that you can see carried throughout the sections. The first of this is the role of external actors. Um, the second is the elite driven process, um, uh, the, the elite driven peace process. And then the third is the issue that the dialogue that was begun um, in the negotiation process was not carried beyond the settlement phase. So to jump right in, looking at external actors, um, what you found from the very beginning um, was that international and regional actors played a very large role. In particular, the former colonial power France, um, as is quite common, had a very close relationship with Cote d'Ivoire. So in the first negotiations, especially the Linas Marcosi agreement, um, it was very central in bringing about that settlement. Um, of course, this then caused issues where Bagbo had to, after the signing of the agreement, had to backtrack um, to save face, and it also resulted in heightening the nationalist debate um, and the identity and citizenship debate, which was um, 
had a link with a patriotic um, narrative that was ongoing. And then in addition to that, you had several agreements that followed, the Accra Accords, the Pretoria Accords, um, which were largely driven by the regional powers, um, including South Africa. And what you found there, as well also the UN was involved, um, you found the liberal peace model being followed and elections being highlighted quite extensively. Um, so in the end, these, these largely didn't succeed, but then you had the Ouagadougou Agreement, um, which was initiated by Bagbo himself, and was seen as a more nationally driven, locally driven process, as, um, it, as, as it didn't really involve these external actors. Um, so this was a move in the right direction. It was seen as being successful in eventually bringing about elections, noting again the focus on elections. But while that was a step in the right direction, there was still a problem in that it was um, largely elite driven. So that leads me to the second theme, which is this idea of these settlements, which largely made no room for civil society organizations or any representation from society, be it interest groups, religious groups, um, gender in particular was, was completely excluded. Um, so the negotiation was largely amongst the elites of the conflict. And because of that, they, their main interest was access to power. So the negotiation became one of how are we going to decide who, who gets power, which then again led to they focus on elections. The key issues, as Naonka mentioned, the issue of citizenship, which was central, was discussed more than it was in the previous agreements, but again, largely within that frame of, of, of allowing them to access power. Since citizenship had been dramatized by the elites before the war for the sake of, of, of winning elections, in the peace settlement process, you had, you had the same thing where identity was discussed in terms of setting up the electoral role and the identification documents in order to build your base um, for electoral purposes. <coughs> And so it wasn't really talking a conversation about who, what's the Ivorian nation. It was a much more technical issue. Um, so as a result, the central issues for the people, which included identity, um, but in a different sense than it was for the elites, and especially the issue of resources and land were excluded in these agreements. So, I mean, you, you can say that this doesn't have to be addressed in the settlement process, but then this leads to the third point of the conversation was not carried further. Um, once the settlement was signed, the narrative that followed, the, the um, conversation that followed was largely inflammatory um, and, and, and just kept inflaming these issues of identity and postponing and postponing and postponing the elections until each side felt they had enough of a support base um, to win. So there was no real mechanism made for real reconciliation, not even a, a real TRC, but even beyond that, just um, dealing with the bitterness caused by the wars. Um, and so basically, it, it just kept, uh, leadership kept the, the issues polarized, um, and you didn't really see a movement beyond where Cote d'Ivoire was before the war. So what does this lead to? Um, the outcomes that you, you saw was the elections, which was seen as a success in the beginning, but then you have the post-electoral conflict that followed. And in that, you at first saw a limited transformation in the identity markers, where you had, um, in the second round, some identity groups voting together. But in the end, once there was a contestation for power, you had these issues breaking apart again. So once you see that issue of the elites um, basically hijacking the conversation for their own purposes. Um, and then once that uh, was resolved through a primarily military victory, you now see a situation where um, there are still issues of victor's justice, uh, but you have Watara focusing on re-establishing security, which is important, um, and on economic development, which is good as it begins to address some of the uh, core issues. However, this needs to be careful. It needs to address the structural inequalities as it interacts with, with identity as well. Um, and as you also saw with that, the fact that the elections were resulted in violence so quickly um, meant that uh, you basically saw little societal trust in the institutions. So I think I'm going to wrap it up because I see something going on there. <laughs> Well, 
I have, I, I'm told, one minute to wrap it up. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you, Sonia, for setting up uh, uh, very nicely so that I don't need to go into some of the conversations that uh, took place after the uh, uh, crisis was resolved the way it was uh, by the victory of one camp uh, and the total uh, annihilation, if you will, uh, politically certainly, uh, of the other. And now uh, the pieces have to be put back together uh, in terms of peace building immediately, but also in the long term uh, state building. And what is it that uh, was done? Clearly, were there lessons learned uh, by the Ivorian actors uh, from, first of all, the clearly failed state building process? And certainly also, to a large extent, the failed uh, peace building process, uh, certainly after uh, the ceasefires, the mini ceasefires and peace agreements that were signed, and even after the Wagadugu agreement. So uh, certainly a number of themes that were part of the conversation uh, needed to be focused on in terms of understanding better, certainly carrying out a, uh, the empirical study on the ground. And we were able to identify quite a few uh, key uh, themes of conversation that uh, we, we felt uh, could be investigated on the ground. One clearly is gender. And as uh, Sonia said, gender was completely left out of the conversations. Uh, and uh, the, the crisis certainly showed uh, the extent to which women in particular and other uh, uh, vulnerable groups were victimized uh, in, in the crisis. So to what extent gender will become central to the conversation. I think that needs to be asked uh, to, uh, uh, on, on the ground uh, of uh, uh, participants. The second issue is civil society. Sonia also said uh, rightly that civil society was by and large uh, excluded. Now, it played a part in the emergence of uh, the conflict, but it was uh, also marginal. When it, when it came to the process by which peace was uh, uh, achieved. So the question is, to what extent lessons were learned from that and that civil society writ large will be brought back into the process? And again, we frame a number of questions that could be asked uh, uh, people on the ground. State elites, clearly they were the drivers of this conflict. It profited them. The state building flaws were elite-centered. So what can be designed to make conflict and tensions less profitable to the elites? I think this question is worth being asked. Uh, the nature of the state, uh, clearly the framework that was uh, uh, worked on throughout the, the, the uh, 50 years that Cote d'Ivoire existed didn't work. Uh, the state has not been built. It is not organic, to use uh, the term of my, my friend Ebo. And uh, uh, clearly something has to be revisited in that process. And I think questions should be asked to people on the ground about this. Elections as the fetish of resolving everything. They did not in uh, 2010 and ensued a crisis. So again, questions could be asked around that. How about executive powers? And one minute and I'm done. Executive powers. The, I think part of the crisis, a great part of the crisis, if you ask me, is again the whole setup of how power is balanced, or in this case, out of balance in Cote d'Ivoire. The executive is so powerful that you would literally die for it and kill for it. So to what extent that aspect of the crisis was visited at all? And I think uh, we, we thought that question could be asked around that. The, finally, the external actors. There were quite a few of them involved. France, from the, the get-go. ECOWAS, South Africa. To what extent did these actors uh, do more harm than good in the process? We thought that these are a few themes uh, that at least need to be asked uh, in any ongoing conversation that connect peace building and state building. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bubaka, Sonia, and Nanyanka. I think you have raised a lot of very important issues about um, the actors, the institutions, 
and the process of state building and um, of state and peace building in La Côte d'Ivoire. The case study is very instructive, um, even if it is sobering, because uh, from your from the evidence you have brought forward, it looks as if uh, La Côte d'Ivoire is still immersed in a crisis of state and peace building. Um, I would. Uh, I know people are taking down notes and they'll be asking you some questions. Uh, part of it, of course, would be that when you are looking at these conversations um, and you say it is elite driven, did you in the field notice any attempt by non elite actors to enter into those conversations? How are they kept out? Um, and what was the price of their being kept out? Would you see that conflict? is the price of their being left out. And if you want to integrate them or get them to participate, drawing from your field work uh, experiences, where will be the potential spaces of engagement? Um, and how can the, the, what I call the external helpers who, who come to animate the conversations in particular directions, how can you also ensure that they don't dictate uh, the process, considering the kind of alliances and, uh, and collusion that takes place between them and the ruling elites. Having said that, I want to go to the second uh, case study, this time by Medani, Tadasi, and Alago Ababu. But I see only, yes, I only see you here. So I invite you to please take the podium, but know that you have 10 minutes that were inherent in this process resulted in civil war, and then we have analyzed the nature of the army movement, especially the one that overthrew the government and established a new order in 1991. Following that, there will be a discussion of the extent the causes that were driving the conflict were addressed by the post-1991 political dispensation, and some propositions that were emerging from the review. The Ethiopian state, being a heir to ancient state, having inherited a pre-existing political structure, has, we can say, a long road, and we can say it has, a, it has interrupted political history. And it was also one of the African states that was able to, I mean, the sole African state that was able to defeat European colonialists and preserve its independence. Of course, this independence was achieved through the incorporation of peoples in the south and western part of the historic Ethiopia, and this process of incorporation resulted in a deeply unequal political structure in which power was dominated by the Amhara primarily and the Tigrayan secondary. So because of this historical trajectory, we can say the formation of the Muri Ethiopian state was quite unique from the rest of Africa. The builder of the modern Ethiopian state, as I already said, it, inherited centralized and highly extractive state that presided over sufficiently integrated society. So the instance of this long tradition of state would enable the successive rulers to entrench their apparatus of control. It has also generated its own contradiction. In the 19th century, when the current Ethiopian state acquired its shape, as I will indicate again, the process of incorporation or the formation of the, 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 the process through which to be acquired its modern shape is through incorporation of various groups. So this resulted in a heterogeneous society. And this has generated some contradiction in the process of state building and peace building. As a result of the incorporation of diverse group of people, there arises an ethnic contradiction. And again, since the post incorporation was characterized by the imposition of the socio-economic and political order of the northern society, mainly those that established the historic Ethiopia, so that again generated a class contradiction. Anyways, while most African states formed some form of democratic rule in the immediate aftermath of independence. Ethiopia was under the 
anachronistic rule of Emperor Haile Selassie. The emperor launched the process of modernization, democratization of state, and consolidation of the army without essentially changing the centralized and ethnocratic nature of the state. So this bureaucratization and modernization without an accompanying change in the nature of the state resulted in contradictions. And this contradiction include the central periphery decision mixture, where centralization of power by groups who are from the central region resulted in the marginalization of those who are in the periphery. So the other contradiction is at the center itself, which arises out of the class issue. You have a contradiction between the aristocracy that was gradually losing power because of this modernization process and the emerging bourgeoisie and the intellectual class as well. You have also discontent related with ethno-cultural separation and religious domination. New state bureaucrats and the students began to consider the imperial region as anachronistic and they began to organize to overthrow that region. And to this end, they adopted Marxism Leninism as a guiding ideology. They attributed the backwardness and impoverishment of the Ethiopian people to the prevailing imperial order. The regime failure to address its own weakness results in that further radicalization of these, these forces looking for change and the consequent overthrow. Two issues especially were very prominent in this struggle for change. One of the issues was the issue of national nationalities. In line with the Marxist parallels, they argue that Ethiopia, far from being a unified nation, is a prison house of nation and nationalities. And of course, there is also the class issue, which was the result of, again, the process of incorporation that resulted in the reduction of a significant number of people to tenants. Plus, the assimilation policy, which imposed, again, the northern cultural order on the south, it imposed the Amharic language on all other people in the court, in public school, and the like. So this again generated an ethnic issue. Amidst of this crisis, the final challenge for the imperial order came from again from the center, which was triggered by the emperor's negligence of the 1974 famine in Wallo. So throughout January to June, various groups began to demonstrate and strike against the imperial. And among these groups, the soldiers proved much more influential. They established, those below the rank of major established a council known as the Dirk. So this council finally deposed the emperor and established some power rather than including all those groups that were fighting or that were struggling against the emperor. So it, it adopted the Marxist Lenin's ideology of the student without including them. It nationalized financial institutions, large scale manufacturing firms, and land, established peasant associations and government administration to entrench its control. And it undertook policy measures related to its collectivization of agriculture, grain acquisition, resettlement, villagization, and all of these were a failure. So we can see that the Dergen is a strong but exclusionary state. The Kabul administration and the peasant association, which were initially formed to enhance self-governance, were used as an instrument of central control and resource extraction. The regime was not able to include the various claimants of power that overthrew the imperial order. It was neither ready to accommodate those centrist forces and the ethno-nationalists that were demanding greater autonomy. Its response was unbridled use of force, so as to subdue any force that would resist its, its, its sword on power. And most of these forces that were struggling again, that were struggling against the imperial order, were now found themselves again struggling against the military regime. They were the outgrowth of the Ethiopian student movement, so a discussion of the long and protracted civil war requires an understanding of how. The, the, the power play and the forces in the Ethiopian student movement. Basically, in the student movement, two broad categories of groups were merged during that time. One group 
was a multinational force. And again, within this group, there were two major parties, the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Party and the old Ethiopian Socialist Movement. So these groups, they considered the primary contradiction of the time to be a class contradiction rather than an ethnic one, though they accept the issue of self-determination. So they argued that a struggle should be organized on a multinational lines. From this, when the empire was overthrown, the old Ethiopian social movement began to give critical support for the dirt. It argues that the dirt can be educated and turned to be turned to bring social transformation in the country. Whereas the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Party called for the immediate establishment of people's government. When this program failed, it turned into urban guerrilla and that led to the infamous Red Terror, where thousands of best and brightest Ethiopians were killed. The old Ethiopian social movement, which was giving critical support, later found itself again decimated by the military regime or the Dirk, because they again had ideological difference. The other group were ethno-nationalists. These groups argued that the primary contradiction of the time, rather than being class, was ethnicity. So first, each ethnic group has to liberate itself, and it's only after that that a pan-class movement will be formed. And they began to wage army struggle from their ethnic base. These groups include the Eritrean People Liberation Front, the Tigrayan People Liberation Front, the Oromo Liberation Front, the Dafa Liberation Front, and others. As I have said, the Derg was not accommodated of both groups. So there, were, there, 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 there was not just single armed group. There were a number of armed groups. So what, I have done, what we have done here is just to discuss the one that overthrew the regime, which is the Tigray People Liberation Front. So I'll be discussing the nature, mobilization, and ideology of this, this Tigray People Liberation Front. The origin of the TPLF, or the Tigray People Liberation Front, is ascribed to historical grievances and conditions in Tigray during that time, as well as the direct response to the manifold problem of the region. Historically, Tigray was at the core of the Ethiopian Empire, the Aksumite Empire, which was one of the civilizations around the world, was established in their area. So this has increased their expectation of the Ethiopian state, which, however, was frustrated as a result of their marginalization and poverty during the time. Tigray had also been the gateway to Ethiopia, and that, that a number of battles between Ethiopians and foreigners were waged on Tigray soil. This devastated the region and fueled the, in the, no, the, the rivalry among the nobility within Tigray. Tigray's modernization has continued during the period of the last imperial, or during the period of Lassie. So by the 1970s, Tigray had no industry, no commercial agriculture, no mining company, and only a few secondary schools. Tigray has to move to other areas, during which they were given derogatory names. This wounded their pride. This was also a period of the political domination of the central region, or Shoan domination, um, which the emperor during this period again used, banned Tigray from using the school, court, and administration. He replaced many of the local nobility in Tigray with his own nominee, mostly from Shoan aristocracy again. So this cultural suppression, political domination, and economic marginalization steered ethno nationalism in Tigray. Hence, the Tigrayan elite began to associate the problem in Tigray with the play of the Amhara elite, or particularly the Shoan elite. The school in Tigray began to, began to be center of dissidence. Tigray students in Addis University, as part of the Ethiopian student movement, began to agitate for change with the largest student body. They used to raise issues of concern for their ethnic origin, arguing that their situation is worse than others, especially Shoans, which they consider as their own historical rival for the crown. When the Derg overthrew the emperor, the Tigrayan hoped for change, which, however, soon proved a chimera. Thus, they formed the Tigrayan National Organization, which later was formed, transformed into the Tigrayan People Liberation Front. Ideologically, there were three central tenets that formed the ideology of the TPLF. One was the issue of um, the creed of democratic centralism, where decisions are made at the center by consciousness and should be implemented by the lower lower cadres without any modification. 
The other issue was the national self-determination issue, where the larger Ethiopian student body, together with the larger Ethiopian student body, they supported the right for self-determination of the various groups, including and up to secession. The third creed was revolutionary democracy, which argued that after some leveling measure, the Ethiopian society basically constituted a homogeneous interest, so pluralist institutions are not required as such. Organizationally, the front was similar with other Marxist forces. And in terms of mobilization, they used a range of mobilization techniques. One was demonstrating that the problem in Tigray was because of the Shoah domination. The other was undertaking development activities in that area again. Uh, controlling rampant band banditry and denying space for other forces were again the other mobilization strategy. In the 1980s, the power balance began to be shifted towards the Tigran People Liberation Front and the insurgents in Eritrea, so the military regime was losing its hold on power. And this resulted in negotiation effort, which however proved a failure. The, the PLF rather began to organize other ethnic-based movements from other regions. Since it is an ethnic-based movement, it, is, it, 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 it was difficult to overthrow the regime in Addis because there are other ethnic groups with their own ethnic liberation front. So it began to form and organize other ethnic-based fronts, which are dominated by the TPLF again. So it established the Ethiopian People Democratic Movement, which later was changed into the Amara National Democratic Movement, and it established the Oromo People Democratic Organization, again from the prisoners of war, so the Derg was overthrown in 1991, and before the overthrow of the Derg region, a conference was undertaken in London, and in that conference, the TPLF agreed to undertake an inclusive transitional conference. The conference was undertaken in July 1991, and most of the participants of this conference were ethnic groups and ethno-nationalist forces. The conference adopted a charter that directly and frontally accepted the self-determination rights of the various ethnic groups and that implied the formation of ethno-linguistic federalism. And these provisions of the charter were further entrenched in the new constitution, which granted sovereign power not for the Ethiopian people as such, but for the various ethnic groups. It granted them, in addition to this, the right to self-administration, including secession. The extent the transition was inclusive was quite contested. Basically, there are three views in this regard. Most are of the view that it was initially inclusive, but gradually political experience rendered it exclusive. Some others considered that it was exclusionary at the outset because the TPLF invited those groups, it wanted them to participate and exclude those it, doesn't, it didn't want them to participate. In any case, the distinguishing feature of this transition process was its emphasis on ethnicity. So the question is, does the post-1991 political dispensation address the cause of the conflict? The result from the literature indicates that it was at best a partial. Ethnic groups, groups were empowered to use their own language, develop their culture, administer their own region, and fulfill their own region's bureaucracy. However, key decisions are still made at the center. Democratization process appears to be fallen back, and in fact, it appears to be regressing in this regard. And there are also still ethnic based liberation fronts that cry for the deconstruction of ethnic hierarchy. One of the significant changes in the post-1991 period is the economic growth. The economy has been growing, and the regime hopes that it will address the economic base of the conflict. The key lessons and emerging propositions, what state building mean in the Ethiopian context? State building and peace building in Ethiopia essentially requires deconstructing ethnic hierarchy and ensuring ethnic egalitarianism democratization of state society relation and decentralization of decision making process to accommodate diversity as well as bringing sustainable and broad-based economic growth. 
So durable state and sustainable peace in Ethiopia requires measures along these three key issues. The trajectory provided so far indicates that there has been steady consolidation of the apparatus of control. The dirt goes unmatched in comparison with the imperial order in its mobilization capacity and in its structure of control. And the current regime is even more powerful with regard to the structure of control. However, this structure of control has not been complemented with popular acceptance of the government, the governance practice. So the critical problem is the legitimacy deficit. Hence, while the Ethiopian state has been strong in its capacity for control, it has so far been weak in its capacity to, co to command popular legitimacy. We identified around six propositions, so now I'm going to present these propositions. One of it is that Ethiopia's central strengths and also weakness in peace and state building derive from its peculiar past. And the conflict in 20th century Ethiopia were caused by exclusionary, exclusionary nature of the state. More specifically, they were about ethnic domination, political centralization, and economic marginalization. The nature of third proposition is that the nature of the protracted war, the type of insurgency, and Organization determines the course of the political settlement and the subsequent process of state and peace building. Finally, the political settlement was not only exclusionary at the outset, but also continues to be even more so in the subsequent period. The other proposition is that the post-1991 political order partially addressed the major causes of conflict in the country and that this is followed by a modicum of peace and stability. And the major issue of consideration in the settlement were ethnic and or national issues, economic conditions, and democratization. And the major actors were ethno-nationalists. Uh, this is our presentation. Thank you, Abdem. Please. Alago, that was a, a very rich presentation. I think uh, when you compare this with the first case study, which was a kind of um, externally grown state building project from colonial rule, the Ethiopian process was internally driven. But it's also very interesting that Abigail tells us that it still had political exclusion in spite of the fact that it's internally grown. And he notes, he doesn't point to political elites as much as he points to what he calls ethno-nationalists. I think this is a very important observation. And I still raise the same set of questions. How do you make this process more inclusive and not exclusive? And even though the ethno-nationalists seem to be driving the process, you also argue that they only partly address the roots of the conflict. And that is a very, very important observation. How do you think, now that you've identified that it only partly addresses the roots of the conflict, what do you think can be done in other ways with the political process and the political conversations that are taking place? in ways that can address the roots of the conflict. Uh, this is just food for thought. Um, now I call on the third case study. Uh, this is a study by Kamau Nokabi, Ekaite Ikbe, and Abiodun Lao, uh, who is going to lead the presentations. Yeah, please, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Okay, we have structured this presentation to two parts. I'll begin the first section, and my colleague Abiodun Alao will conclude this. <laughs> oh, my senior colleague. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
<laughs> so this is a product research between uh, myself, uh, Abedin Alao, and Nectar Eka Ikpe. Um, I must begin by first of all tabling my, my biases for Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone was the first research I ever did, so it's sort of my first love. So, and when, you're, when, you, when you continue doing uh, research on a topic, you know, you grow attachment or you develop attachment to that particular country. country. So we seek to interrogate how the management or the outbreak of, of conflict following the 1991 to 2002 civil war in Sierra Leone, how the management of that out of conflict facilitated the, the society's <coughs> revisiting of the central issues that were at the heart of their state building process. And we, we say that, uh, you know, uh, locating or addressing these fundamental issues of governance help us to locate the, the connection between peace building and state building, in which peace building represents an interlude in the state building conversation that has now turned violent. We have five, five, more, five main questions that are central to this study. One is, what is the Sierra Leone state, Sierra Leone's historical tra trajectory in relation to the state building conversation that took place before the Civil War? The second one is, what, is the, what was distinct about the, the process leading up to the settlement, the distinct features of that settlement process, and the consideration that dictated that settlement. The third one is, to what extent has the formal agreements that were reached following that civil war, did they bring about lasting peace in Sierra Leone? The fourth is, to what extent has peace building returned Sierra Leone to the original state building conversation and has and have fundamental issues of governance been addressed. The, the fifth one is what identity issues, including gender, that were taken part in the, you know, in the peace building process. Our, setting, our central argument is that five, four main issues are central to the state building conversation in Sierra Leone. The first one is the identity conversation in the quest for nationhood. The second one is the search for legitimate and effective national political culture. The third one is the politics and intrigues involved in the management of natural resources and, 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 and endowments. The fourth is the re-engagement of societies or communities at the margins of, this, of the state. So we posit that, each, that in order to address or lead to lasting peace, there's a need then to revisit this conversation. And it's only by revisiting those central issues that lasting peace can be built. So if we can begin with the historical evolution of the Serenian states, we identified four main factors. Like I mentioned before, that is one, is the nature of our ethnic relations, the nature of political governance, the management of natural resources and social exclusion. These issues following in independence in April 1961 laid the basis for what we call the inevitability or stability syndrome and therefore are rooted in you know, the root conflicts of, 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 of the Civil War. To begin with the, first, with the first point about the identity conversation in the quest for nationhood, Sierra Leone identity conversation, the state building processes, was, was main, involved mainly the control and the domination of the state resources and the political sphere by uh, political elites. Political elites, first of all, during the pre-colonial pre period, that, that identity conversation was mainly between the Creoles and the indigenous populations. The Creoles, or the, the British, sorry, privileged the Creoles over the native populations, and this resulted to the, and this made the, the, the native populations irritate, they were less economically, economically uh, they were economically disadvantaged. As a result, the Creoles had, had an air of superiority among them. They believed that they, their mission was to civilize or to bring light to the native populations. This created racial, religious, 
and ethnic you know, distinctions between the Creoles and the natives. These racial and prejudicial distinctions, however, underline the legal, administrative, even religious and cultural you know, distinctions in the colony and the protectorate. But following, as, uh, but as independence approached, the British, following you know, the, the protestations by the Creoles, began to, to increase the political participation in the governance process of the, of the natives. But this, but the, the Creoles in turn you know, they were not so pleased with that because of their air of security they believed to, to acquire. And, uh, but following independence, you know, those divisions have, have continued to reverberate throughout the political culture between, between the Creoles and the, the Mendes, the native, the native populations. But that, then, that conversation then shifted largely to between the native, now the native populations, the, Nem, the Mendes, the Limas, the Temnes, and, other, and the other 18 ethnic groups. This conversation was largely uh, over the control of the states and its resources. Political organizations as a result and were largely uh, based on ethnic differences. The founding, uh, the Sierra Leone's, Sierra Leone's liberation people, Sierra Leone's, uh, the, first, the first political party, the post-independent political party, the Sierra Leone uh, Liberation People's Party, and uh, Stevens, Steven, uh, Steven Stevens and the APC, the Africa All, All People's Congress Party, as such reflected these ethnic differences between, within, the, within, within, uh, within that society. So Stevens' dictatorship, in particular, was you know, or his rule was you know was very was very uh, particular about how he into, instrumentalized ethnic identities. He sort of filled up all you know all the the meter, the, the security sector with his own people. So the emergence of the emergence and development of ethnic political identities have you know played a significant role. In, in development in, of cla in class formation and domination of the states in Sierra Leone. However, elites, have, like I've noted, have wired their interest through eth ethnic identities and have undermined the emergence and development of a collective sense of national nationhood. My second point about the, the search for a legitimate and effective national political culture seeks to examine how the exercise of political governance in Sierra Leone, you know, and to extent this conversation has been, has included the whole society, the whole society of Sierra Leone, but it reveals a very distinctive narrative of elite-centered, you know, governance process to the exclusion or to the detriment of social transformation in Sierra Leone. The elites have largely, you know, been, uh, been exclusionary and have you know centered their own, they have sort of uh, centered their own interests in the management of uh, or in the management of the states in Sierra Leone. Their, elite, their indifference to the, to the larger society demands are driven largely by political co contestation of the consideration of power and state resources. And there are three four three main features that have characterized this. This one includes repression. Authoritarianism, brutality, and the brutality of the political governance. Two is corruption, and the third one is the emergence of an alternative radical politics. If, if we can begin with the repression of brutality, repression and brutality have been components of the governance process in, in Sierra Leone. The British restructured the chieftaincy system, the chieftaincy system in Sierra Leone to serve their own you know, uh, colonial divide and, co divide and rule policies. Before this, the chieftain chieftaincy system was had you know its own methods of check checks and balances, but the the colonial process undermined this you know these values of accountability. So the chiefs became more corrupt. They became you know instruments 
of British rule and, and, and sort of integrated or laid the basis for patronage in Sierra Leone. With independence, the political elites were ruthless in how they dealt with you know, dissent, both within the opposition and within their own regimes. For instance, you know, divisive politics from 1960, uh, between, largely between the SLF, SLFPP and APC, grounded on ethnic and, and regional alliances, and weak, you know, weak support bases fragmented the political system in Sierra Leone, and with it, the hopes of any collective national identity. Military groups also, uh, you know, are a product of that, you know, ethnic or those elite, elite, uh, elite contestations for power. They unmasked elite greed, and they had a deductible impact in the state building process. Corruption as well had a more far, you know, reaching effect in, 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 you know, explain in, 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 in the civil war and the, the state building process. So the above elite governance process and its associated brutality, corruption, and, uh, and exclusion have laid the basis for an emergence of a radical political, uh, political alternative. Uh, Professor Rashid and others have, have interrogated this, this, uh, this a lot. Abdallah, Professor Abdallah notes that um, the emergence of that political, uh, political alternative, however, did not have a political consciousness. Ruth, in fact, did not have a political action or did not have a, a sort of a vision, of, a broad vision of what they wanted to do after gaining or, of, or acquiring power. So this radical political culture was mainly like the Professor Rashid says, was mainly you know, embedded within the student activism. The, the third factor, that we, the other issue that we looked at in the state building process is the, the nature of governance, the, natural, the nature of the governance of natural resources in the state building process. Sierra Leone is significantly endowed with natural resources. It has such resources as gold, diamond, bauxite, rutile, and iron ore, including land as well. However, these natural resources, the management of these natural resources has not resulted you know, to economic benefits to largely, you know, relatively small population of five million people. The central government has been capable in how they have, re in the management of these resources, they have not been responsive and responsible in the management of these resources. And as such, there have been five main factors that, you know, that have uh, that emerged, or there are five features that, have, that are prominent in the natural resource management in the country. The first is the role or the level of corruption and the elite. The elite appropriated the, the resources for their own personal enrichment. The second is the role of the Lebanese. The Lebanese connection with the business, business elites in the country you know, led to a, you know, to a complete exploitation of the resources and a prolongation of the war. In fact, the, the civil war in Lebanon was, has, you know, was rumored to be financed by the exploitation of the minerals in, in Sierra Leone. The third is the activities of illicit miners. Illicit miners from all over the world came to Sierra Leone to exploit its resources. But compared to the government itself, the people of Sierra Leone were more comfortable with, the, with, the, with, the, with this illicit miner because they were sort of paid some money from, the, from, from these resources, especially diamonds that they, they were able to get. The fourth, the fourth consideration was the use of security agencies. In, in, in exploitation and domination of the, of the resource producing areas. Stevens' dictatorship was particularly, um, particularly uh, conspicuous of, of using security agencies to dominate these resource producing areas. The fifth and lastly is the neglect of the diamond producing areas. As we will see shortly, these areas were neglected 
despite the, res the resource endowment that they, they had. So if we look at the last point on the issue of state building, the, on the issue of the conversation of state building is the link, re-engagement of the, of the communities and society. And two points stick out. One is the neglect of the resource producing areas like I just briefly mentioned. The other is youth marginalization. So the concentration of political power and economic activities in the, in, in, in the, in the center resulted in the neglect of the rest of the country. Districts such as Kailahun, Bo, Pejun were completely neglect, neglected. And this led to a sense of hopelessness. And it's not surprising as such that these districts at the periphery of the state were the basis for which uh, Roof, the rebel, rebel group, launched its attack, and also the, the operational basis upon which the attacks were, you know, were carried out. So I will not go much into details about the civil war because I think that has been extensively covered. But I would just like to mention three or you know, four main factors that we believe are, are, the, are central to the causes of the war. The first is the mismanagement of, natural, of the country's natural resources. The second is the absence of credible democracy. The third is the total neglect of the rural communities. And the fourth is the contagious effects of war in neighboring Liberia. Three characteristics of war are worthy of note because their contribution is shaping the future of Sierra Leone. This is the extent of brutality. If we can just go back to revisiting that conversation, the extent of brutality, the diversity of factors that are involved in, in, the, in the conflict, and the third one is the, 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 that is the role of diamonds in the conflict, the perpetuation of that conflict, and the fourth is the nature and final cessation of conflict. So if you can look at the, at the peace process following that civil war that ended in 2002, we note that there are f the number of uh, four distinct features of pre-settlement and settlement process. One is the multiplicity and shifting alliances between the main protagonists. And we can note two points from that. The first is that there were some actors, despite you know, the dominant role they played in that conflict, who were not recognized as being actors in that process. One, one person stinks out, an individual in fact. This is Charles Taylor, his role in supporting rebel, in financing the war in Sierra Leone. The second is you know, the patterns of alliances that continue to shift so that the, you know, at one point there were juggling alliances between the government, the rebel forces, the, the civil, civil, the Karamajor, the civil actors, the, the government, and different governments. So all this, all this multiplicity of actors made it very difficult to implement or sort of to enact a, you know, a quick peace-building peace building process. As noted previously, there were a number of main, a number of peace-building actors that, you know, that, whose motivations were also very much questionable. This include you know, ECOWAS, Nigeria, UK, and, and, and there, there are questions about to what extent they, they their interest were in the peace building process. So as our entry point, we have uh, looked at the flawed peace agreements and, if, and especially so focused at, on the Lome peace agreement, which, which now laid the basis for the externally driven peace building process. And we note that there, there have been three main, main agreements which were signed to end the civil war in Sierra Leone. The first is the Bijan Agreement, which signed between the government of uh, President Kaba and the roof in November 1996, and terminated following the May 1997 coup. The second was the Conakry Agreement, signed in October 1997, between the military junta of John Paul Koroma and ECOWAS, which was terminated when ECOMOG removed a, the, the Armed Forces Republic Council junta from power before the due date stipulated in, in that particular agreement. This was, these two agreements were later followed by the Lome Agreement, signed in July 1996, between President Kaba and Ruth. However, um, that we note that there, 
a distinct feature in all those agreements, and this is the extent to which this agreement sought to appease the main protagonist, and as such, sort of laid the basis for a quick you know, resolution of a conflict to the detriment of addressing you know, the issues that were central to that state building process. Lome, the Abidjan Agreement, for instance, granted am general amnesty to Roof in return for rebels, for the rebels ending their violent activities. The main aim of Conakry Agreement was to allow for the return of the, of the overthrown government of President Cuba, uh, of President Kaba, within six months. But largely, the Lome Agreement was emblematic of a number of omissions and commissions that undermined the sustainability of of lasting peace in, in the country. First of all, the Lome Agreement ensured the disarming of a uh, roof, but controversially and erroneously pardoned for the Sonko for treason and, granting, and granted him the position of, uh, of vice president and chairman of the, of the commission that oversaw Sierra Leone's diamond mines. And as such, we note that this, the agreement the, ba the agreement was largely based on the person of so for the, for the Sonko. They sought to appease him so that he would not, they gave him, or gave him all these concessions so that he would not return, you know, the, uh, the Sierra Leone to conflict. So by giving him those positions, except the, uh, the, the, president, the presidency, they sought to, you know, appease him. This Secondly, there was a, you know, a lack of a credible sanction regime, regime to deal with any non-compliance with that agreement. And as such, this gave room to, to Roof and, and Fode Sonko to maneuver however they wanted, and as such, delay the peace process. Secondly, the Lome Agreement gave you know, positions to the Roof, cabinet positions to, to, to Roof, and as such, legitimized uh, the roof as a political party, which would then allow for the organization of for 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 participation of roof in the organization of elections. Article uh, Article 11 of the agreement also controversially granted roof absolute and free pardon in respect to anything done by them in pursuit of the objectives at the time of the signing of the Lome Agreement, and so you know the question about how then. To what extent then was victim justice pursued in, within that agreement itself? The, uh, the second, uh, the third, the third uh, characteristic distinct feature of that peace building process was the uncoordinated you know, international response. Sierra Leone is a model of international disengagement. It represented minimal interest to, to the West and as such, they sort of allowed the, you know, the, 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 the civil war to continue without you know, intervening as quickly as, it, as they should have. So the Lome Agreement then laid, you know, sort of made the entry point for UNAMSIL, the United Nations, United Nations Peacekeeping Mission in Sierra Leone. However, that mission faced a number of you know, significant operational challenges that undermined its mandate. One of these is its, its weakened mandate, its lack of contingencies, uh, its lack of uh, troops, conflicting contingencies between, for instance, the Indian, the Indian and uh, Nigerian leadership. So this resulted in, in the events of what is now so-called the May 2000 events, in which 500 UNAMSIL peacekeepers were captured and held hostage by, by roof and ultimately led to the collapse of the, of the Lomi Agreement. So the May 2000 events, as others have pointed out, represent a lack of contingency planning on the part of the force and over-reliance or erroneous assumption that the, peace, that the, the Lomi Peace Agreement would work. So if you look at the, the, that section of this presentation, the distinct, the distinct feature of the, of the, the post-settlement process, we note two main features that align the peace-building process. One is the Sierra Leone 
Truth, Justice, Sierra Leone Truth and Justice Commission and Special Courts. A key feature of that, of the external post building program Sierra Leone was the promotion of transitional justice, national healing and reconciliation through those two, those two agendas in the form of uh, the Sierra Leone, the TRC, court, the, CR, the TRC, and special courts. However, notwithstanding the operational and funding challenges that marred the two processes, you know, we note a number of features that, 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 that we say do not lay the basis for, for revisiting the Sierra Leone state building process. And one of these is relates to the tension regarding the overlapping mandates of the special court and the TRC. TRC. In fact, some perpetrators you know, feared giving testimony be before the TRC because they felt that they are, those ten testimonies would be used against them in the special courts. So and the second point is the lack of confidence within this, uh, the Sierra Leonean people about the mandates of the special courts because, for instance, uh, a number of the key perpetrators, including uh, ICCC, uh, Fode Sonko, Sam Hinga Norman, Sam Bokari, John, John Koroma, were never tried because <coughs> some of them actually died before justice you know, was delivered to the, victims of the, of, to the victims of the Civil War. The fourth, the second point in that regard also, we, in terms of questioning, you know, the, the Sierra Leone just in the truth and justice process was the mandates of the timelines for the two institutions. You know, it further raises the extent to which, you know, the those two processes revisited, the, you know, the the historical state building process. And we note that the special court was mandated to deal with atrocities committed after November, that year, November 1996. Additionally, Section 6 of the TRC Act of 2000 tasked the Commission with the objective of creating a historical record of the violation of human rights beginning from 1990, beginning for the, from the beginning of the conflict in 1996 until the signing of the Lone Agreement. So these two, these two, these two limited timelines time and the operational basis of the, the TRC again you know, cut the historical you know, process in the state building state building conversation. Lastly, the international institutional capacity building process in Sierra Leone has largely focused on building the technocratic support, you know, establishing microeconomic stability, and also building institutions in form of police, the special courts, but they have not really addressed the, you know, the historical and sociological processes in, in the state building process. So thank you very much. I invite my colleague, my senior colleague. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, chairperson, we know we have um, overstretched our generosity, so we won't take time, I can assure you. Uh, yes, uh, thanks a lot. Um, uh, my colleague and um, brother, um, <laughs> for that very wonderful presentation. Uh, um, but let me just stand up by spending just a few minutes. Um, I know we've exhausted our time. So the point is, um, three things have come out quite clearly about the situation that we are talking about in Syria alone. That has to do with the diversity of ethnic politics, the politics and intrigues uh, associated with the management of natural resources and corruption. And these three things are quite crucial to understanding the civil war and quite a lot of things that have happened since the end of the civil war. So what I want to do by ending is the fact that what are the situations now, especially along these three lines? On the issue of um, um, the diversity, or let me say the disagreement between the various ethnic groups, um, we still have that um, in Sierra Leone till date. Uh, there are still problems. Uh, um, rivalries and tensions between the uh, Mendes and the Timnes, it is still there. And this, and this particular problem has manifested um, in the nature of, um, of, of, of national politics. Uh, the problem associated with the management of natural resources still remain, even though it needs to be pointed out that to a very large extent, uh, 
positive steps have now been taken to ensure that um, natural resources are now being well managed in, in the country. There's this usual joke that um, when God created Sierra Leone and endowed the country with enormous resources, other countries of the world protested at the way that God has benefited the country. And then God said, wait till you see their leaders. And um, so, 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 but I think successive leaders in Sierra Leone have not been trying to address that. But corruption, corruption still remains and uh, it continues. But again, successive governments have been trying to make sure that uh, the negative implications of this um, are, are, are considerably reduced. So um, going into the field work now, we have a set of propositions that we are going to, to test. And I'll just quickly read those uh, four propositions out. The first one is the fact that after a bitter civil conflict, enduring peace and stability can only come after key issues underlining the original conflicts have been addressed. The second one is that politics surrounding the management of natural resources is central to the establishment of long-term stability after a bitter civil conflict that had occurred partly because of natural resource mismanagement. Then the third is that identity conversation, including gender, have not been adequately addressed in the case of Sierra Leone. And finally, that externally driven peacekeeping process has not anchored the basis for stable peace Say in the country. I just want to thank you the very much. Rolling. By making the claim that uh, Kenyans, myself included, believe that they have a very unique country. And that must be our entry point into this discussion. They believe they have a very unique country precisely because they have never had uh, uh, the experience of sustained, long-term, intense violence. And uh, they, for a long time, believed that they were this island of peace in a sea of, uh, in a, in a sea of, um, of, of, of conflicts. Until 2007, December happened. And then they all feigned ignorance about the fact that they could experience the same conflict. And so our task has been to begin to understand the origins of those conflicts and to explain if the peace settlement did in fact address, has in fact addressed those issues or not. And as a theoretical entry point, I think we in a sense, borrow from this notion of conversation and conversable spaces, but give it a twist at some point because Kenya is one of those few countries where there is everyday conversation about something. And that something often touches on state building issues. However, often that conversation almost sounds like a conversation of the deaf. Too many things being said, but perhaps very little being heard. And therefore, if you are thinking about state building, and you are thinking about conversations that enhance the ability to construct a nation, Kenya might not be that, might not be that example. And the reason for that was actually uh, very well put in the recently published novel by Yvonne War called Dust. She said that Kenya has three main official languages, English, Kiswahili, and silence. And I wouldn't have found a better way of posing that dilemma of state building in Kenya. Because amidst these conversations that are taking place in Kenya, there is either a dialogue of the deaf and if it's not a dialogue of the deaf, there is an elite interest to choreograph particular conversations that do not contribute to the state building project. And for me, therefore, when Kenyans feigned ignorance in December you know, 2007 about that post-election violence, it was a further illustration of that conversation that we are talking about, which is periodically interrupted either by a carefully choreographed uh, divers diversionary conversation or a conversation that really is just about um, uh, nothing constructive in relation to state building projects. 
And so over the long term, if I was to do a careful historical analysis of that, that is the kind of uh, conclusion I would be drawing out of the various episodes of attempted conversation and periodic silence or almost amnesia about the state building project in Kenya. Uh, the first moment where a real conversation was meant to happen was the, the year 2002, when there was a change of, of government. But two years down the line, three years down the line, again, the ability to see that conversation reaching a fruition was terribly interrupted by a declaration by Kenyan people that they did not like the draft constitution that had been given to them. So that opportunity was lost, and then the roller coaster, of course, went into the 2007 post-election violence. Uh, an international community was invited, and that represented the key moment in which a real conversation began. And so when we talk about the peace settlement that is the cornerstone of our own discussion today, it becomes very clear that that conversation uh, was a conversation jump started by a collaborative effort between international uh, a effort on the one hand, the African Union on the other hand, and local constituencies that forced that discussion onto the table. The point, though, is that we need to understand the reasons why this conversation was constantly being interrupted. And I want to invite Rachel to come and uh, give us some snapshot understanding of uh, how the culture of authoritarianism has interrupted repeatedly our ability to have a conversation as Kenyans. And then I will ask Clement to come and talk about issues to do with land. And finally, I'll ask uh, Catherine to come and uh, speak directly to the issue of exclusion and marginalization, which we think are central. Please, Rachel, come. Uh, which we think are central to this whole thing. We have agreed that they will take each two and a half minutes to three minutes to finish. Good morning. Um, so, yeah, I'm vertically challenged. Uh, <laughs> to pick up from uh, where Dr. Murunga left, uh, authoritarianism grew out of a structure of governance that the Kenyatta government preferred. And this structure of governance was later institutionalized through a series of constitutional amendments. By 1982, the state uh, had stifled most forms of political engagement, leaving just uh, a one-party authoritarian system that formed the greatest challenge of state-building project in Kenya. It also led to the silence, the culture, or the conversation of silence that uh, Dr. Murunga was talking about. And the characteristics of this culture of authoritarianism were centralization of power in the president, uh, strategic dispersal of powers across the country through provincial administration, deployment of national security apparatus to counter any possible organized opposition, and rewards for pro-government and victimization of opponents. To achieve silence, uh, loyalty was either bought or secured by force. The loyalty of the security sector, for instance, was secured, was secured by ethnicizing its top leadership and ensuring that top-ranked officers were well rewarded uh, through government contracts, land, among other resources available to the country. This was enough motivation for the security apparatus to silence uh, vocal politicians, university faculty, and other factions that dared to challenge the status quo. Why do we call it a culture? We call it a culture of authoritarianism because it's not like any other authoritarianism that we know of a president staying in power. It's entrenched into the political system and it's intertwined as we will see in other issues in governance and politics in Kenya of ethnicity, of uh, youth marginalization, among other issues that will be discussed by my colleagues after. The culture of authoritarianism, therefore, uh, has far-reaching implications to Kenya's state-building project. Moi, um, well, Kenyatta, Moi, and later Kibaki, they all ruled on authoritarian exclusionary process, for instance. And this exclusionary pattern defined the culture of authoritarianism in ethnic terms such that the authoritarianism was about the incumbent and his people, the people from their community. 
and ethnicity became even a way of uh, a strategy of consolidating power. So uh, Ajulu and Kagwanja, for instance, talk about um, courting ethnicity. As the culture of authoritarianism grew, uh, the possibility of comprehensive natural, um, national dialogue became limited. Instead, there was the assumption that things would be in place once there's a uh, president in power. Not surprising, it was through the president that a version of dialogue and peaceful coexistence was expressed. Dialogue and conversation was thus mostly individual, by individuals and not it was never a national dialogue. It was just different groups of people initiating conversations, and they would ob obviously get into trouble. By the time Moy left in 2002, the debate had shifted from national dialogue to truth-telling, to justice, and to reconciliation. What is interesting is, that, is the fact that despite the aforementioned issues, um, the regimes ensured that there was harmony and stability. And for instance, uh, the 24 years that Moy was in government, we did not have any violence. There was stability. But this stability was superficial and could in fact be argued to be uh, Kenya's biggest source of instability. If further interrogated, one realizes that it was regime building and not state building. Uh, and it explains what happened in, in the 2007 post-electoral violence. The December 2007 violence uh, was only an event in a continuous struggle for nation building, and it was a state building conversation that was unfortunately violent, but it was also an opportunity for the country to start a peace building conversation. And so from here, I, my colleagues will elaborate on the other issues. Thank you. So um, continue, continuing from where my colleagues have already uh, stopped, I would present some statistics about land in Kenya for your um, consideration and your attention also. Um, you realize that 20% of Kenya's land, only 20% of Kenya's land is arable. What it means is that up to 80% of the land cannot be used for much, you know, in terms of what many Kenyans can benefit in agriculture and all. And yet, 70% of the population is employed in the agriculture sector. Um, and up to 80% of the population live in southern and western regions of the country where the land is arable. That should tell you that land is a really contested issue in Kenya. And between um, 1995 and 2007, that's just in a spirit of 12 years, um, urban populations increased from 30% to 40%. And that already tells you that um, vices which usually are associated with urban, uh, increase in urban populations have been an issue in Kenyan urban cities, especially where the government has not been able to address grievances over land. But if you look at the post-election violence of 2008, many scholars have tried to link it to unresolved land issues. And there are scholars like um, Atoko Amana uh, Onuma, who is a very prominent scholar who thinks that people who had land-related issues vented out their anger after the, the post-election violence and that sustained the conflict for a period. And so where do we place the genesis of land grievances in the country? It, it trace, it, we can trace it back to colonial uh, eras of manipulating people for land. And here I can cite the 1904-1911 uh, Maasai agreement between the British and um, the populations in the Rift Valley. And you realize that in those same colonial eras, um, there was a creation of white highlands where indigenous people were ejected from their lands to create um, room for the white people 
to do business and to survive. That already created, started creating um, grievances for people. People started clamoring for justice. But this justice was never done, especially among the Kikui people and Maasai in the Rift Valley. And so it was expected that after independence, the Kenyatta government would do something about it. Did he do something? Still a, a debated issue because as I proceed, you would see that um, Atokwamana Onuma, for instance, thinks, and so uh, there's many other scholars, thinks that the, the history of Kenya's land administration can be, can be divided into two eras. The first era is between uh, 1963 and 1990, where the government had indirect use for land. Indirect use for land means um, land was mainly used for investment in agriculture, tourism, real estate development and stuff. And so the Kenyatta government, for instance, ensured that because you couldn't directly benefit from land, you that, that there was proper um, in institutions and legal frameworks to ensure that land ownership and property rights are properly catered for. And so he, he created um, institutions like the Department of Land Adjudication and Settlement and so many district land control boards between 1963 and then uh, 1990, where you couldn't just evict somebody from his or her land, and you couldn't redistribute land without passing through proper institutions. And so during this era, we cannot say the government wasn't doing enough to settle people and to make sure that the land question was addressed. But that was terminated um, in the post-1991 era, where multi-party democracy was becoming a big thing in Kenya. Uh, politicians were short of funds because the IMF and the world is global institutions which were funding um, governments in Africa during the Cold War era, especially uh, in development partners, seized the inflow of foreign aid and attached foreign aid to democratic reforms. And so what the Moy administration had to do was to get money internally to pay for their supporters, to fund their political activities, and so many other activities happening on the ground. What, what, what happened was that land had to be sold. And so the use of land moved from being an indirect source of income to the creation of direct sources of income. And so land began, they, be, they began to sell land for money. They began to dish out land to uh, their political supporters. They began to evict their po political opponents from their lands just to give it to people who supported them. So that already created um, animosity, which was even at a deeper rate than the animosity that was created during the co colonial era. And so we have two um, periods here, which we are, we are interrogating, and we think uh, more data is still coming out from there. And so we cannot, like I, I said, we cannot just conclude that it has the, the land problem starts from colonial manipulation and eviction of people. But it also has its own post-independence uh, dynamics coming in there. Um, but can we, can, we can we conclude that the, the government of Kenya was unable to deal with the land question, or they were unwilling to deal with the land question? From what I've just said, it, it's pretty obvious that the government was not willing to solve the problem because solving it will mean not getting the, the kinds of uh, funds and resources to fund its political activities. But it's not that straightforward, because there were, there were also questions of um, competing claims over land, which came from, OK. So um, since I've, I'm, I'm being asked to finish up, there are some consequences which come with the inability of the government to solve the land question. People who were dispossessed of their land in the rural areas were relocating to urban areas, which increased the rural-urban drift, 
and created problems in urban communities, increasing the slum um, proportions in the urban communities. And other. It also led to creation of youth groups like the Mungiki, um, who, people who, had, who, are, who were forced to move from their places of abode to urban areas just to uh, find uh, su survive, means to survive, you know. And so all these things happened. But uh, we, we have also discussed the issue of whether the post-election settlement has solved the land issue or not. But there's no time to talk about all those things. So I think I'll end it here. Thank you. Okay, um, from what my colleague has said on land, I'm going to talk about exclusion and marginalization. And from this, um, I have four points, and I'll quickly go to my first one. Um, on land, we find that Klopp argues that from, there's a huge connection between the process of land allocation and the control of state, state power in, in, in Kenya. And you find that in exclusion along ethnic lines, we find that there are political el these political elites have um, they recruit state officers based on their ethnic um, ethnicities and regions. We find like in the Nairobi and central provinces, most of the infrastructure is actually allocated uh, in terms of uh, who is actually in the power or who is the president or who is the governor. And this, uh, some of these issues we find in terms of state positions. There are other ethnic communities which are underrepresented, and most and others are actually overrepresented. And uh, my second point goes to the youth. We find that uh, exclusion, youth are really ex excluded for most of the activities that go on in the state. And this uh, is actually, it draws back to the historical memories of injustices. And we can see this from the post-election violence. Most of the people who are engaged in this were the youth. And in the issue of also Mungiki, we find that uh, there are a lot of, uh, they address their grievances in terms of uh, conflicts among in the community. My third point is on women we find that women are also excluded from the national conversations that go on. And as far as I know, women did not uh, enjoy legal or constitutional equality. And we find that when women are, uh, are not, women absence in these uh, decision-making processes also threatens the state res resourceful managers. We find that if most of them are denied these opportunities. Some of them are not able to exercise their full potential in the community. And on my fourth point is on borderland communities. And these borderland communities, I'm talking about the communities who occupy environments that uh, do not provide actually sustainable livelihoods for themselves. I'm talking about the Pokot, the Turkana, and there, we find that their, city, their citizenship is questioned. Uh, the activities that they undergo, the pastoralism, if their activities are criminalized. They are criminalized according to the, uh, to the activities that they, go, they undergo. And uh, we find that their grievances are also marginalized. As far as these communities are marginalized, their grievances are also marginalized. And we find that when state uh, fails to provide security to, the, uh, to them, they actually take matters into their own hands and they end up uh, acquiring uh, weapons and they address their grievances in terms of uh, conflicts. And we find that silence has actually been noticeable over the past years in the fact that the government barely gives feedback to these individuals. And we find the recent uh, issue on, uh, on the oil in Turkana. We find that now it's not the, the, the cattle rustling that they were fighting for before, but it has come 
to be a land rustling issue because of the fact that the government does not uh, provide the specific uh, security to them. So um, from this, uh, silence is really um, a con uh, something that has been noticed in, in addressing all these grievances. And thank you. Thank you. We should clap even more for Catherine because this is her first presentation ever. So, really to wrap up, um, we think that uh, Kenya poses a very interesting dilemma. The dilemma in which peace building and, nation and state building do not always go together. Uh, as, as we said, uh, the three points that uh, uh, Catherine, Rachel, and uh, Clement raised build up into the process that leads to the post-election violence in, 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 in different ways. And the agenda items of the peace settlement actually begin to capture some of these things. What is, even, what is more difficult to understand is that though Kenya has been having a conversation around state building, one cannot actually describe that conversation or describe that conversation as contributing to peace building. So there is a lot of animosity in the conversation, and yet we expect that conversation to contribute to, 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 to state building. Uh, as someone has argued, and I agree, if you want to know that Kenya is, is in civil war, go to the social media, because that's where people say many of the worst things that you can ever say. And so the tension between peace building and uh, state building is very, very much present in Kenya. As to whether the peace settlement has commenced uh, a different conversation, as to whether the peace settlement is going to provide the basis for sustainable peace building and therefore state building in Kenya. I think that the jury is still out, but uh, ever since the 2013 general elections, uh, the trend has been to continue to reproduce elements of the authoritarian system that uh, Kenyans are too or already too aware of. And the recent attacks and violence happening across the country, some of which have to do with terrorism as an issue, but many of them are a reproduction of some of the old tendencies that we are all too aware of. And so the jury in our, in our, in our, in our argument is still out around whether we are beginning to experience a different conversation leading to state building, and we hope that the research we will conduct going forward uh, is going to help us begin to address some of these uh, questions that we have raised. Thank you very much for listening to us.